Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. My name is Julio Davila. I'm Professor of Urban Policy and International Development at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit. So I'm delighted to have you here. I can't see you, so I'm not sure where you are, who you are, but, um, but I, I'm really happy to have you here and I'm looking forward to meeting you uh, next academic year. What I thought I'd do, and some of you may have been to uh, Haim Jacobi's lecture, is talk about a little more about the theme that he started. It. Not because we're completely uh, obsessed with health or we focus exclusively on health, but it's an area that I've, I have a personal interest in. I've been developing it, developing it for a number of years, um, starting with collaboration within UCL for a very interesting piece of research that we did uh, for The Lancet, famous medical journal based here in the UK. And that sparked my interest as to how we planners, people coming from the built environment, can contribute to health, public health, better health. And so I've been, it's not an opportunistic thing, it's nothing to do with the pandemic, although the pandemic has actually exacerbated or um, sharpen that interest. But it's a genuine interest in the fact that as the world urbanizes and cities become bigger and more complex and there's more conflict uh, and we consume more and we reach areas that have not been reached before, which are biodiverse and undisturbed in nature, then uh, it becomes there are problems that arise of um, a whole range of um, natures, like zoonosis, disease, zoonotic diseases, the ones that jump from vertebrates to human, but also chronic diseases, um, lifestyle diseases, which are exclusively urban. And up to now, a lot of these actions, interventions have been led by largely public health professionals uh, at, at different levels. So my belief is that we can, as urban development planners, make a contribution to that. So this is just a, a short taster of the sort of things that we do at the DPU. And essentially what we do is work across disciplines. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, you will be interested in working across other disciplines other than yours. Will be will be stirred and and um, and and uh, increased. So you some of you may have seen this, um, and I'm sorry I'm coming back to the pandemic, but the pandemic is a, an issue that we're dealing with, and it's not the last one. As you can see, throughout history, starting in the uh, early 2,000 years ago, or little less, uh, there are a number of plagues, largely in Europe, but in other parts as well of the world, that have been documented. And the first one that we have an idea of is the Antonin Plague. Of course, that was in, in, um, in the Greek Empire, followed by a very deadly one, the Plague of Justinian, which killed about 50 million people, which at the time for a very, very small population in Europe and in the world was a massive number. And then, and then you can sort of follow on to the Black Death in Europe, which killed between half or maybe even two thirds of the population in some areas of Europe. Um, smallpox, which killed tragically, you know, the vast majority, about 90%, some people say, of the population in the New World, in the Americas, where I come from. So my ancestors actually brought, uh, and I have ancestors on both the indigenous and the Spanish colonizer side, the, but the Spanish colonizers brought in deadly diseases that the natives didn't have protection against including smallpox. And then there are a number of uh, cholera outbreak, I'll mention that in a minute, uh, HIV, HIV AIDS, which has killed about 35 million people so far. And, and now of course, COVID, um, which is about two and a half million worldwide. This is a little old. Now, the, what I want to emphasize here is that urban planning started out as, a con as the result of concerns with public health. So if you're studying urban planning, 
if you aspire to study a master's in urban development planning, this is where your roots are. And, and that's true for virtually all the masters that we deal with. It's a concern with people coming together in cities in a very dense, um, uh, relatively limited uh, area with inadequate infrastructure and facilities and scientific knowledge to deal with that, the problems with that proximity brings. Of course, cities are wonderful because they bring people together. That's where the knowledge comes in. That's where the creativity and innovation, that's where human relations are. That's where people can be at their most creative, but they have this downside, which is if there is an illness that can be transmitted from one person to another, that density makes it worse. So London in the early 1800s was the first city in the modern era to reach a, a million inhabitants. Uh, of course, cities like Rome, um, Baghdad in Iraq, uh, Cordoba had reached nearly a million or about a million, a thousand or two thousand years earlier. But in the modern era, we, thanks to industrialization, London, where, where I am, and some of you may be, was the first one to reach that in, enormous number. It was a city of very stark inequality. Those of you who've read Charles Dickens would know that. But the mortality and morbidity rates were very, very high, particularly among children. So the children, scores of children died before the age of one or five. Um, in the 1830s, such were the stark contrast between the rich and the poor that 10 year olds from high income families were eight centimeters taller than those from, uh, from the poorest um, families. Um, at the time, and science was in its infancy, it was, it was actually, in many ways, medicine killed more people than actually saved, you could say that, um, because they, they, were, they were quack, they didn't know really what the cause and effect were in terms of acting upon an illness. But the scientific belief, which dated back to the Greeks 2000 years earlier <clears throat> was that infectious diseases spread through the air, the miasma theory. So people weren't around covering their, 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 um, uh, their noses and, and uh, trying to burn things that would change the smells in the streets and so on. So that to ward off uh, these theories. So of course, that's true in some ways. It's not miasma, but that's true of um, COVID. It, gets transmitted through tiny particles in the air, but that's only one uh, of many uh, such diseases. Um, coronavirus tend to have that uh, particularity and so does influenza, but most other um, infectious diseases don't. So there was a, a need to react and to respond and the, uh, through huge pressure, the parliament in here in Britain passed a series of acts to deal with the serious health issues starting in 1832, then in 48, then in 75. And then that led to the creation of the Metropolitan Water Board because water was proven to uh, transmit these diseases. Just so up to the end of the 19th century, European cities, uh, public services that or utilities were essentially or exclusively in the hands of public commercial companies intent on making a profit. Water was not a right that came much later through you know, a series of struggles. Uh, and anybody who could not pay for a connection and was caught stealing water from a private source, whether it was a well or something, could go to jail. So there was no right to access to water. Without water, you can't live. So you can see the difficulties of the poor were, were involved in. Um, but the killer diseases like cholera made no class distinctions. And this is an example you, you see here of two companies, Camberwell and, and, and the Southern and Vauxhall Company, sorry, the Southern and Vauxhall Company customers uh, in green, this one here. Uh, the, because of the sources of water they use, they, which were contaminated, they were leading to huge numbers of deaths or people getting ill. Whereas the next one, the one next door didn't. So there was something strange in terms of, you know, why are some people getting ill and why are others not? And here comes um, a hero, a hero of epidemiologist who is 
one of the people credited with um, inventing epidemiology, even though he didn't know he was doing it, he was a, a, a doctor, he was essentially um, delivering babies. In fact, he delivered the, well, at least one, if not two or three babies of Queen Victoria at the time, but he was also had a scientific trained mind and that's the important thing. And he observed that there, there were quite a lot of deaths in an area in London, which I hope you can come and visit, called Soho, uh, which is very dense and was very poor. Uh, and around Broad Street, you can see a replica of, today a bronze replica of the pump. Around this pump, a lot of people were getting ill and, and dying. So he put two and two together and said, hang on, if people are drinking from this pump and getting ill, there must be some link between the pump and and illnesses and you know it's a long story and it's a wonderful one that of course epidemiologists love to tell then he discovered discovered that the, that the cause was actually the pump and therefore the water that was carrying something that you know was to be found out later was killing people so uh in many ways the deaths from infectious diseases lie at the core of modern state interventions uh, in cities I should say, not, not in trade, trade was different and the agriculture was different, but in cities, uh, planning was born as a result of that. Um, Snow's discovery, discovery and insistence by a professor in UCL, Edwin Chadwick, who, um, you know, you will, when you come to UCL, uh, the buildings, you would see a building called Chadwick Building. He was UCL's first professor of engineering, but others too, Put a lot of pressure on governments to enact uh, regulations, new legislation, and eventually to the nationalization of public utilities. And that led, as you can see in the graphs on the, on the right, to a huge drop in infant mortality and, um, and a massive increase in average exp life expectancy. Uh, and this is, this is where a lot of these investments and, and enactment happened, you know, started here in 1847. So much so that by uh, the 2000s, a poll taken by the British Medical Journal amongst doctors said that the, the greatest medical advance in 150 years was access to water and sanitation. I must add, to clean water and sanitation. These, this knowledge and this inter set of interventions were actually um, exported to the European colonial you know, colonies through a number of enactments, um, acts, regulations. And again, that spurred the growth of modern Europe, modern African cities uh, in, in former European colonies. Uh, and I'll give you an example in a minute. But they were based on various spurious reliefs. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful book by um, Anje Jo, who's a former PhD student of the DPU years and years ago. Uh, who's based in Florida, I believe now. But uh, he uh, sort of, he relates some of these issues. Um, there were beliefs that were completely spurious because science was in its infancy and um, it just, anybody could say anything and there was no way of proving it. Microscopes were, were starting to be used, but you know, there was no, no scientific, uh, systematic scientific knowledge as such. And there were no ways of, of looking and measuring things in a way that we have now. Um, but there was a belief, for example, that natives disliked cleanliness and were immune to malaria. Then there was an early belief that malaria spread from the soil to, uh, through the walls. So that led to housing being built on stilts. And you can see that in India and many Indian um, housing types still today and some parts of, of the former British colon colonies and so on. So there were lots of, of uh, problems with like, like these ones. Um, for example, they, they discovered finally, because science made huge advances towards the second half of the 19th century, uh, the Anopheles mosquito, which transmits malaria, as you know, it's a, it's a vector, was active at night. Then segregation between Europeans and, and natives who were believed to be transmitting this illness was enforced during the night, but not during the day. So there were all sorts of these horrible measures to keep Europeans safe, but you know, natives, who couldn't, who cared, who cared? They didn't really care much. Now this led to segregation, the segregation that you see even today, because there's a huge inertia. Once you enact 
planning regulations, land use planning regulations, which have to do with things like density, design of infrastructure, uh, land use attributed to some users rather than others and so on. These things, um, once they start growing are very difficult to redress or change and rebalance. So a lot of the fabric of a city like Nairobi today, where which had, unlike Accra in West Africa, in Ghana, Ghana uh, Nairobi in Kenya had quite a lot of Europeans, largely, largely um, uh, British, of course, settlers, because it's high, malaria is not as bad there, it's cool and so on and so forth. But they also brought in uh, through a number of means, um, workers from distant lands like India and what is today Pakistan. Uh, and so what they did was to enact legislation that meant that the rich, well, the Europeans could settle in some areas and the Africans could not settle in these areas. So uh, these that are hatched here uh, European private estates, which you can still see today, they're very, very low density, beautiful tree coverage and so on, and more about that in a minute. Then you've got other more dense areas, unrestricted for Europeans, so it's a little denser. And you've got the Asian areas like parklands here. And then you've got enclaves for the African workers which are much more dense. It's not that there were many less Africans. There were, of course, they were very controlled, like South Africa would later control them through apartheid, you know, and the, and the past system. They were very controlled, but they were living at very high densities. So this is a map from 1948. Now, remember this, this area is roughly here, right? And here. So bear that in mind when you look at that. Here is the area that we're looking at. And you can see, if you look at the in monthly income today, well, 2011, the same pattern is replicated today. You see that everything that is in blue is high income, you know, above 24,000 shillings, Kenyan shillings, monthly income. And, and the areas in red are the lowest areas. And these are the areas that were originally designated for the Africans. And these are the areas that are still poor today. So. This inertia in land use planning is something that we have to be mindful of. Now, why did public health and town planning drift apart? Because you don't see them talking to each other. Now, public health concerns are largely in the case in the hands of epidemiologists, um, clinicians, but town planners or urban planners or urban development planners have little say in, in these matters. There are a number of reasons. One is that the miasma theory through scientific advances was eventually superseded by the germ theory. So the, the idea that disease, infectious disease spreads through germs, tiny, tiny things that we can't see, um, uh, either through particles in the air, floating in the air, like COVID, in fact, or through Anopheles mosquito biting you and injecting um, uh, a parasite which then sort of transmits malaria. So these tiny things that are invisible are, are transmitting things, not through just the air. Uh, so that was a first change. Eventually also health became more focused on individual behavior and on disease rather than on preventing disease. And this actually served um, medical companies and pharmaceutical companies very well because it meant money. It meant that rather than preventing disease, disease was occurring and you were trying to cure it. And that meant selling drugs and selling services. So it actually uh, became a, a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. Um, so the disease, uh, the thinking about disease changed from dealing with the physical environment as in the way that I was telling you about in terms of architecture, design, in terms of spread, spreading people apart, in terms of segregating them, to the lab where the germs can be actually analyzed. And therefore, you can actually see, OK, well, the, here's, a, here's a little thing that actually kills people. How do we deal with it? Let's develop a drug that actually will kill it or will protect you against it, which is exactly what we're doing now with, with the COVID vaccines, is we, we're creating the immunity so that the body de uh, develops the defenses to protect itself against the, the virus, SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, eventually, because this was taken from their hand, away from their hands, uh, planners eventually ended up seeing themselves as professionally unqualified to conceive, formulate, and even implement health, as Joe puts it very elegantly. This meant that eventually professionals that were working together drifted apart, became part of different ministries. And again, there's a very strong institution inertia, institutional inertia. Once you design an institution, it's very hard to break it apart because it becomes a subject of, of um, entrenched interests, whether it's from professionals themselves or politicians or employees of the ministry or the institution, they're very reluctant to change. Humans are very conservative in general. Once they have a security, uh, institutional livelihood security, they don't want to risk it. Why should you? You know, if you, you're perceiving a, a, a salary and you're doing your job adequately, but nobody challenges it, then why change it? So the two professions got entrenched into different institutions, whether it be ministries or, or local government officials, uh, or local government bodies, they became separate. Now, um, and I'm nearly finished. All these um, has for, as I said, for over nearly a year, 10, 10 years now, I've been studying this and I was, privileged enough to be part of a fantastic study on urban zoonoses. I remember I mentioned zoonoses, the, the infectious diseases that jump from vertebrates to, to humans, uh, of which there are viruses and all sorts of pathogens. Um, I was invited by Professor Eric Fev from the University of Liverpool. He was then at Edinburgh University and now based in Nairobi, has been based in Nairobi for a long time to do this study. And this is where um, we've, I've learned um, some of these things. I still have huge amounts to learn, but again, it's one of these ideas that we as built environment professionals can actually contribute to this. So a, a recent paper published only um, a, a few weeks ago by uh, one of the members of the team or several members of the team, I'm not one of the authors, I'm sadly about this, uh, looks at a profile of Nairobi. So you can see the city here, roughly, you know, sort of these are the, the low density, uh, nice big compound areas on the left. And then you, you get closer to downtown and you see the high rises, you see the informal settlements at huge density. So the density goes from, from low to high and the wealth goes from high to low, you know, uh, correspondingly in a city like Nairobi. It so happens that these areas are also higher in terms of elevation because they're cooler and that's where the Europeans want to be. These areas are a little lower and a bit hotter, therefore. What, they've, what the research has done, apart from much more, because it's a five-year research and still producing masses of papers linking precisely animals and humans in different ways, including you know, consumption of meat, consumption of milk and other animal products, biodiversity, um, animal, um, wildlife, wildlife, and so on. And this is the work of, uh, uh, led by James Hussell, who, is, who himself is, a, is a, an ecologist and he works on wildlife. So he was doing things like trapping rats and trapping bats and trapping birds and so on, and measuring the, the degree of infection of a, a pathogen called E. coli, which was the marker that we used in the study for this. And um, so what he, they found too is that there's a high biotic habitat diversity in these areas. Whereas if you go to the central areas, because there's very little greenery, there's very low biotic habitat diversity. So there's, there's a wildlife, a huge diversity of wildlife here, you know, monkeys and birds and rats and rodents and all sorts of things, uh, much less here, but this is dominated by what, what is known as synanthrope uh, species, which are animal species that like animal, to live with or close to um, humans. And that's not only dogs and cats that we all, oh, I love uh, at least, uh, but also other animals which can actually benefit from that um, proximity because they feed from us, you know, whether it's rodents 
or whether it's livestock that we feed and we also feed from and, and get um, uh, an advantage, some sort of um, benefit from. So the human density is low and livestock density is low and here it's high. So this is the sort of things that tell you immediately, hang on, we're looking not only at illnesses, we're looking also at cities, land users, densities, wealth, poverty, and this is what we do as planners, right? So how can we contribute to that? So why did public health, so just to continue this, why did public health and town planning drift apart? Uh, and my contention is they did drift apart for historical and institutional reasons, to some extent scientific reasons, but it's never too late to let them, get them to talk again. Uh, and, and research like the one I've just shown you is showing that we can collaborate with other kinds of scientists, whether geneticists, vets, uh, medical doctors, and so on. And this is something that I'm in my sabbatical year. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be on a sabbatical after eight years as director of the DPU. Um, and my colleagues are very um, gracefully and generally awarded me a sabbatical. This is a, some of the things that I'm interested in and I'm working on now. It's, uh, it's a steep learning curve, I'll tell you, but, but it's something that where we can actually contribute, and I'll give you another example. And in fact, as uh, Professor Marmot, who's also in UCL, one of the leading figures in, um, in public health, particularly linking so social profiles and health, um, and very interesting work that you should um, all look at, uh, and he says, health is too important to left solely to doctors, right? Doctors are clinicians. They're not public health people necessarily. And that means, you know, there's engineers, remember these water and sanitation, there's architects, there's other kinds of built environment professionals, urban designers and so on. And we can also contribute to that. Um, increasingly as cities become richer, of course, infectious diseases become less important bar the odd pandemic, like the one we're living through now, but you know, by, by and large, that is a problem. Uh, and they become more chronic, but also in chronic diseases, we and lifestyle diseases, we can actually do something. And for example, planners have been partly due to health concerns, not infectious diseases, um, although the pandemic has spurred this movement anyway, but for the last 10 years or maybe 15 years around the world, and none of these pictures is recent, it's taken, they've been taken up, taken them in the last, what, eight, 10 years around the world. They've been carving out space for bikes and taking it from cars. Why? Because of this, you can see, you know, cars clog up, they emit, they, um, they, they not only consume um, fuel, but also they emit, they emit, uh, things that are noxious for us and kill us eventually, and they do kill very seriously, um, or lead to things like Alzheimer's. And it's been proven now by science that you know, sort of highly contaminated streets can actually accelerate Alzheimer's processes. So there are very clear links there, but also uh, to allow people to use active forms of travel, like walking, like cycling, like um, using other forms of travel. So, so Again, this is one small example that most of you, no doubt, will be uh, familiar with, uh, with micromobility, where planners have realized it's not only about getting people faster to where they want to do, but it's about the last mile and it's about reducing emissions and making cities more livable. Um, the final thought for you is to think about a lot of what we see in the press, a lot of what you read about comes from the big, the big cities, the mega cities, cities of 10 million or more. And these really clog the international press, websites, but we mustn't forget that a large and the vast majority of the urban population in the world actually don't live in mega cities. So the UN projected in 2014, I, I should have got a, a more recent projection, but just for the sake of argument, by 2030, <clears throat> they projected that 41 cities would be mega cities around the world, increasingly in the global south, that 63 cities would have five to 10 million, 558 cities would have, uh, would be medium-sized cities, one to five, but that 
a vast majority, maybe half of the urban population would be in urban areas which are smaller than 500,000. Now, the trouble with 500,000 or less, particularly in the global south and in many countries that you, some of you will be familiar with, is that the, the resources, financial and humor are much less than what you find in, in these cities. Yes, the problems may be smaller, but that's where the population is growing. So that's another challenge for urban development planners is how do we address the problems of, of a growing population in these areas which lack the human and financial wherewithal to do so. Um, I will stop here. Let me just see if I can sort this out. Uh, and I will show you briefly <coughs> the bibliography <coughs> if anybody's interested. Um, there's quite a lot of fascinating um, readings. I've been enjoying lately uh, uh, Frank Snow. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I, I've been enjoying uh, Frank Snowden's Epidemics and Society, which uh, was written before the epidemic. As a historian, now retired and professor emeritus at Yale, and, and tells us history of, of um, epidemics. But you know, you can also read you know classic books like The Price of Inequality by Stiglitz, Nobel Prize winner. Um, and this is the article that I was mentioning, Hassel, Socio-Ecological Drivers of Vertebrate Biodiversity. This is where I got that graphic from. So I'll stop here and um, just give you, I realize we have about 15 minutes uh, or so for, for our discussion. So uh, there is a Q&A function at the bottom on the right. I don't see any questions uh, so far. You can raise your hand. I'm not sure whether that works because I can't see you. Or you can actually probably write on the chat as well. I'm not sure. Anyway, so that's the end of the lecture. So um, any questions anybody has, please put them on the Q&A. Uh, Jane, Okay, I don't see any questions. So that means other people were, oh, Julian. Um, I would like to know about the role of soundscapes in the urban planning and public health. Um, not sure what you mean by that, soundscapes. Can you, can you be a little more, uh, can you explain yourself a little more, uh, Julian? Are you, do, do you mean uh, the role of noise in, in issues like mental health and livability of cities. Thank you, Maria Rula says, amazing lecture, very interesting. Thank you, thank you. I don't know, I'm not getting an answer from Julian, so I don't know whether anybody else. Oh, the issues related with noise. Oh my goodness. I'm not an expert in noise, but, but again, uh, it's an interesting question and, and it gives me food for thought. A lot of the, the internal combustion engine is by definition noisy because of the way it's designed. But electric cars are much less noisy. And so a move towards electric cars and electric vehicles generally is likely to lead to a, a less noisy city. But then there are man-made activities, there's an issue of behavior. When I've been in Cairo, and I've been in Cairo several times, I haven't been for a while, and it's a city I love very much. The first thing that strikes me, uh, or Indian cities, if some of you are from India, it's the noise, you know, people honking all the time. So, so yes, you can control for things like moving towards electric vehicles, preferably public transport vehicles, uh, but can you control uh, people honking? And that, you know, honks will be there forever because, you know, they're a way of uh, alerting passenger, uh, pedestrians and other cars that you, know, you have to keep away. But if you overuse it as they do in India, it's just maddening. So yes, I, I think there are ways, there, there are other ways as well in terms of segregating land uses, which is the legacy of modernist land use planning or modernist planning, which is about segregating uses. So you have areas and cities and the Corbusier, those of you who come from an architectural background or planning background will know the name of the Corbusier Swiss architect uh, and, and others. 
it was about segregating cities where you have residential areas in one area, you've got shopping or leisure center areas in another, you've got industrial areas in another. And that actually means that you have to travel to, to find work in other places. Now, that was partly about um, noxious fumes from industrial areas, but it's also about noise. Uh, but the trouble is that modernist planning, which produced Amazing cities like, um, uh, you know, the, the plenty of brand new cities or extensions of cities uh, like Brasilia in Brazil uh, also are very expensive because you have to keep the land uses segregated and you have to, uh, there's very little flexibility in that. And, and that plan by, for example, is a sort of UNESCO uh, plan approved by UNESCO, it cannot be changed. But that segregation is costly. It's costly because it means land becomes very expensive. So the rich live in some areas, but it means also that you cannot change it. And therefore people have to travel for work or for shopping. And therefore you are using fossil fuels, you're using time, you're wasting time in these areas. Anyway, it's a, it's a, long, it's a long, long story there, but um, you, Joanna Munione, how do you see planners and public health officials working together in the future? What kind of projects? I, I can give you an answer later, Joanna, uh, and, and I would invite you to actually, when you're here, to, um, to help me with that question. I, th I, th I see them, <clears throat> the very good question. I think the first thing is to educate public health people and, and, and including clinical pe people about what we can do as, as planners or built environment people. But that shouldn't come from them. It's, the onus is on us by doing research of the kind that I'm hoping to be involved with, or I have been involved with, to show that we are relevant and we can actually contribute to public health. So it's about raising our profile. It's about raising our capacity to, to deal with these issues. And, and increasingly, we're putting together right now a proposal, a research proposal, to look at um, active school travel. So how do kids travel from, from home to school and back, walking, cycling, or using other means, or, or walking in groups, for example? Now, that is not simply an education area, education sector problem. It's also a planning and urban design problem, because you know the streets have to be safe, they have to be readable. You, you have to be able to walk or cycle safely without being um, killed by a car or having a car accident. Of course, you have to be also safe from, um, from people who are sexual predators, for example, for kids. Um, so lighting is important. And, and, and even though it, it looks like a design problem, it's actually a health problem, a public health problem. These kids who don't walk to, to school, uh, but are, are, are driven to school, and that's true of particularly rich kids, um, may develop eventually obesity problems because they're not they're not actively traveling right so it's about designing the streets it's about working with both public health people uh, to understand you know is there an improvement in that if when they walk so it means putting accelerometers on on kids actually measuring the the a number of um, performance indicators if you like health performance indicators before and after they do that so you can actually say well actually see these figures demonstrate that when kids walk to school they they their health is better their weight is lower they gain um an idea of autonomy which is very important and they they know their rights so you 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 sort of tick a whole load of of, of boxes which are are not public health and they can be initiated or, or um, facilitated by a good urban design and good urban planning or transport planning for that matter. Um, how is your son? Uh, in case of creation of urban planning public health, is there any interesting evidence or research trend at the moment that implies that there may be some uh, reconverged in the future? Well, I think my, my answer to uh, Joanna goes to some extent towards answering that question, Hauge, I hope, I hope it does. Fui Amevor, thank you for your presentation, Professor. What examples in our modern era have you seen where public health professions or plans have worked together effectively to improve people's health? Again, 
yes, it, it sort of goes back to my, my point earlier. Um, I think increasingly these issues of urban design, uh, the issues, for example, of designing uh, transport systems like the BRT systems, but rapid transit systems, increasingly, uh, and this is transport planets rather than urban planets, although they do have to work with urban planets, um, have realized by working with epidemiologists that by designing well-lit, accessible, physically accessible bus stations through the bus rapid transit systems, people, not only are you reducing, and, and actually by pushing everybody, as many as you can, on public transport, buses, whether it's underground systems or bus rapid transit systems, which of course we know are much cheaper, and especially less, uh, less con contaminating if they're as they are now moving increasingly towards being electric buses. Um, by doing that, you're reducing emissions, but also you're increasing the incentives for people to walk because then you have to now walk towards the bus stop, which may be 350 meters away, which is an active form of travel, uh, and then walk at the other end, rather than stopping as it was in many Latin American cities. And I know it is in, in, in sub-Saharan African cities with Matatus and with, with other kinds of uh, forms of transport, you just stop it where you are. So it means you don't walk, you don't have an incentive to walk. Now, the, the, the streets themselves may be very difficult to walk on because you know they may be full of holes and traps and you can actually break a leg, particularly if there's not good lighting. But that design is actually sparing people to, to walk and, and, and be more active in cities. Abigail Seva, very interesting lecture, thank you. Do you have any book recommendations for someone in studying social development? Key books that link social issues to urban planning, perhaps. Oh my goodness! Write to me, but also write to uh, write to uh, uh, Andrea Rigon and Julian Walker if you're doing social development practice um, masters. But um, write to me, and I'll see. I'll have to think about that one. Luai Kakani, hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm personally curious to ask if you have any perspective on how we can tackle urban public health issues associated with lower income areas without triggering gentrification are very interesting. Cycling, a great example of indirect gentrification through, through urban strategy. Um, I'm not sure about that last sentence. Cycling is a great example of indirect gentrification through urban strategy. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm not entirely sure I, I agree with you. And, and again, we're looking at a huge, huge um, range of, of situations, but I can give you one that I'm very familiar with and I can give you a whole lecture about that. I'm not gonna, um, bore you with that. But um, urban public health issues associated with lower income areas, again, good urban design uh, and, and interventions which have as a focus the poor, the low income areas, the informal settlements. Um, the best example I can think of, but partly because I've been studying it for over 10 years, is Medellin, second largest city in Colombia. And I've been studying uh, modes of transport there, more particularly a series of interventions that were revolved around aerial cable cars. And you can, if you go to my website on in the DPU page, you would see a series of links to that. And I've given lectures and there's a couple of little films and there's a book you can download for free and so on. But that is a case, even though it wasn't thought about as a public health intervention in any way, it has actually led to very good positive public health outcomes. We were not there measuring those public health outcomes, but I'm, I'm telling you, and nobody, I don't think anybody has done it in a scientific way. From my observation of that intervention is that, again, you, you provide a cable car to an area which is steep and hilly, very high up above the valley which sits at the the city sits at the bottom of the valley so you know up to three or four hundred meters above that valley there are lots of people living in informal settlements long story i'm not going to go all through that and the first cable car which was designed to be a commuter car in a city as opposed to a typical ski lift using ski lift technology or typical tourist cable car but it was designed to be a commuter car in a low-income area was this one 
opened in 2004. So it's a fascinating case. You can read about it. And, and what that did was it came with uh, a number of interventions, which actually were done by the mayor, the subsequent mayor um, or two mayors after the, the guy who actually implemented that cable car. And um, thank you. Somebody, I think Alex has put uh, the link there. Um, okay, so off we have more. Okay, thank you. Um, so that, that actually has meant that the cities are improved enormously. They're much more walkable. Uh, again, the access to these areas is much easier and so on and so forth. So I, I'm, I know I'm, I'm sort of running out of time. Maria Rubla. Ah, and Maria is from Medellin. Great. In cities like Medellin, where I live, we have been suffering about health diseases as a consequence of pollution, bad quality of our environment. I agree. It's a, it's a valley, very narrow valley. So the, 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 um, the air, uh, the contaminated air, sits there. But also, Maria, remember that it's been now proven by scientists that a lot of the pollution in Medellin actually comes from, from distant areas. From, um, it's blown from, from uh, the, the east by winds, so it doesn't help. But she says, I believe that as urban planners, we need to start thinking about these issues so we can plant cities that can improve the quality of life of our inhabitants. What do you think about this environmental as and our role of urban planners? I think the question, the, the answers that I've given you give you uh, some ideas, so, but it's, it's fantastic that you guys are thinking about these things. Gabriela K, regarding public health and planning, do you see any significant changes in city planning caused by COVID? While cholera significantly changed cities, cities like their sanitation, et cetera, will COVID have such impact to, you know, on planning? Yes, it has, it has already. It has already, particularly in, um, in the rich cities, but also in medium income cities. And you can see it in Latin America that that spurred a movement towards which I have, I'm, I'm ambivalent about, to be honest, uh, but a, a movement towards individualized forms of transport because people uh, don't want to catch the virus and be infected and led to a huge rise after the lockdowns in private uh, vehicle use, which is not good because it's a close to streets because of emissions, because of uh, fossil fuel consumption, because of climate change, all the things that we, we believe. But it also has spurred, and I have a couple of lectures on that too, very interesting changes in the way that cities are designed, that priorities is given to, to public uh, transport and to active forms of travel like walking and cycling. And, and London is a case in point. There are a number of, and what it did was to speed up a number of changes that were already occurring in, in cities like London. Paris is another very good example. Um, but it was is already changing because planners for a long time have been saying we have to move people out of private vehicles and onto public transport, which is uh, less congested and, and less contaminated. But of course, the fear of infection through uh, spanner in the works for that, but also um, active forms of travel. And that's where we can come in as planners and design, urban designers. And that, that is very important. Um, Joanna, John again, Munioni. Do you think much can be changed by the land issues, land use issues existing in the global south in Nairobi, for example? What other way planners can reduce segregation? Wow, that's a difficult one. That's a very difficult one. Precisely because Joanna and and I presumably you're from Nairobi uh, or you you're aware of um, Nairobi, because of this terrible inertia of planning, historical inertia. Once you've designed something in such a way and, and decided on land use, it's extremely difficult politically, economically uh, to change things and, and redress them. But I think you can enact, uh, but if you have the political wherewithal, but remember a lot of the power in political power is in the hands of people who own land or who are rich enough to own at least these low income, uh, sorry, low density, high income, uh, plots of land, and therefore enacting any legislation that allows you to do that, or passing a master plan or, or a development plan that allows densification, will, is likely to to lead to um, to reactions, negative reactions. Uh, Latin America has done um, some interesting has some interesting examples. Um, I don't have time because I'm running out of time, but but it's a very valid question you have, Joanna. 
Thank you for that. Um, Anna Zumayeva, to perform city planning jobs suggests I can only work in public sector. Is that correct? No, it's not correct. Well, there are there private companies that perform some jobs? Yes, the masses of, of firms, John, um, Anna, sorry, uh, that uh, either provide uh, advice to governments or to the private sector, masses of them. Um, just check out firms like Arup. Um, there are masses of largely well, the British, um, American, uh, French, uh, even Lebanese companies working in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Russian companies and so on. Some are better than others, that is fair to say, um, and some are more principled than others. So you have to be careful and work with uh, a firm like Arup here in London, which has offices everywhere where they have, they're very ethical in, in the way they operate. Um, there's another fantastic one called Buro Hapold, also based in the UK. Nicoletta Michalettos, do you think it is necessary to think about planning and health at the global scale? For example, production cycles happen all over the world with the production spaces often located in places with lowest labor costs. This labor force is often working in terrible conditions for very low wages, certainly a public health questions, yet they make the things that feed into other places, economies, which consumers buy in the richer global cities. How does globalization play into planning and health? Fantastic question. You would see answers to that complex, uh, to complex question, complex answers to that in, when you come to your masters and, and this is an area that, that we deal with. And you're absolutely right, Nicoletta. Uh, Cities like London or Paris or New York can be cleaner thanks to the fact that a lot of the pollution that produces, you know, these sort of things that we consume, these sort of things that we consume uh, is don't, are not made here. The pollution is somewhere else, right? And the bad living conditions are somewhere else and the bad pay is somewhere else. And we can actually benefit from accessing uh, these, these gadgets because pay is lower. And because work is often are exploited, and not necessarily by the companies, but by the, the companies that subcontract in the chain, in the supply chain. And that is true also of pollution. So yes, globalization certainly plays a, a huge role in planning. Um, and that's a fantastic area. And, and it's an area where I think I'm going to finish. I don't see any more questions. Thank you for your fantastic questions. Um, I think we have, uh, you know, a number of participants. So I'm going to finish there. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you to Alex, who has facilitated the process, to Giovanna, who I don't think she's there, but she, um, uh, she provided the invitation and, and the ideas for this. So thank you all. And I hope to see you all in uh, the autumn or as soon as you're able to get here and we can go back to a, to a normal life of some description. And I hope um, you're all well, your families are well and look after yourselves. Go safely, go well, okay? Bye-bye, thank you, bye.